Hello, everyone. This is Zach Reagan. I'm here in uh, Dixon, Tennessee. We are uh, doing a Facebook Live videos now for Wednesday nights, as you are well aware from looking at the Facebook post. And we've announced this as being something that we desire to do. Um, I am going to make sure here real quick that all the... Okay, it does look like we're, we're working okay. Um, coming from you, like I said, here in Dixon with the House of the Lord Ministries, um, Bob Taranjo's here with me. He is, uh, we swapped roles today. He's the audio vi video engineer. So if there's any mess ups, anything, pressure's on Bob. <laughs> he used to do that to me. So I figured I'll turn the tides a little bit, put the pressure on him. Um, no, it is, it is a good night here. I'm excited to get these going. Uh, I, I really honestly, you know, I have some ideas the Lord's laid in my heart. I see some different things for this, but just as we do on Sunday, I'm going to lead this thing up to the Lord. Whatever the Lord desires to do with this on Wednesday nights, you know, Bob talked about last week, there will be some rotations possibly as the Lord leads. I'm going to start us off on Wednesday nights, but I just really want to see what the Lord does. I know that there's a few things in my heart that I do feel, and, the, and a few of those are to address some of the things that the Lord's given me knowledge on in the professional field that I work in outside of ministry, and that is to deal with the problem of addiction. Um, one of the main ones is addictions to drug and alcohols, but also to start addressing some of the other things people may not be familiar with uh, when it comes to food uh, addiction, uh, drug and alcohol, as I said, uh, sex addiction, uh, gambling addictions, all these different type addictions, and, and also to explain some of the mental health uh, education I've had in some of the different areas, because I know that you're dealing with it. Um, I, there may be people listening to this uh, video that, that we're going to be doing the, on Wednesday nights that, that may even be suffering from addiction. And if I can help anyone out there that needs to hear a word, not just education about it, because that's one thing I hope to provide is a little education, but also an encouraging word, uh, a kingdom word, a true word, not a doctrinal statement about if you just pray hard enough and believe hard enough, everything's going to go away. Um, I believe there has to be more work than that. And we're going to talk some about that. But a, but a true living word that I feel that what one of the main things the Lord has laid in our hearts is this word has to make itself known in the earth realm. It's one thing for this to be a spiritual wor word. It's one thing for this to be in the heavens. But I believe right now there's a ministry that's beginning to grab into the heavens and bring things into the earth realm to unlock some people that are in hell. I believe the, the whole, um, outside of the large scope, a large part of what Jesus did was deliver captivity, captivity from hell. And I believe that as we begin to take on that ministry uh, in our lives that the Lord's given us, that should be one of our desires to see people set free. So hallelujah. So um, I, I am excited tonight to get, to get going with this thing. I don't know, as I said tonight, I have a few things to, to, to ju just do some setup, to kind of give some explanation, to give some background, to do some of those things. And if the Lord leads, I may teach a little bit on uh, the disease of addiction itself. But before we can continue to go, I just want to say a quick prayer for a moment. So, Lord, we come to you tonight, Father. We're just asking your blessing be upon us tonight, God, that all those that are listening in tonight, or whether it be on the recording in the weeks to come, Lord, I ask that there be words that are spoken tonight that can help somebody, Father. Enlighten us, Lord, in these, in these troublesome topics, Lord. Not only in the troublesome topics, but enlighten us in your word, Lord, your true, pure word. I ask that these keys that you give to me tonight, Lord, be helped to unlock to some people, some mysteries unto you, that they can see a little bit more of the Christ and the reality of what you are and who you are in their lives, Lord. So I just ask that you be with us tonight, Father, and I ask that you be with us in the days to come. Hallelujah, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. So I do, to, to do some more setup here, I, I feel that Wednesday night is going to be different. I do. I, I, I feel that. I believe that it's not going to be, honestly, what maybe some people are used to, that you think of being a uh, churchy type thing or a spiritual type thing, but that's all right. There, there has to be some things change in order to break on and to plow some new ground. So I believe that, as always, the Spirit's going to be involved. Um, teaching in general has a different anointing and a different presence to it. Um, but I, I believe that, that with this, I'm hoping that the Lord gives me the wisdom to tie in some of the earthly knowledge along with the spiritual knowledge to really help establish some things in people's lives. As I said, I know that maybe you're listening and need help yourself. 
But also, there's family members. I, I, I hear it all the time whenever I go into meetings across the country or whether it's a phone call in here to, the, uh, to Bob and, and Charlotte in the days gone by, she would always relay messages of people communicating things to her of family members that we would pray for here at the house. So I know it's out there. Again, not only the addiction, but the mental health piece, depression, bipolar, all these things that as a people um, sometimes that get, that get spiritual and even religious about things, sometimes these are things people want to avoid talking about because it, it may seem as though people's face weak or that people aren't believing in our Lord enough. Well, I'm here to tell you that, that I hope that we can be a people that are balanced enough to minister to these things, that we aren't just going to get up and put them in a prayer line and if they're not healed, blame it on them and say they didn't have enough faith. I'm not here to do that. Even if you listen to these things and you still struggle, I'm not saying it's a one-all, uh, one be-all. Jesus is the one all be all, but it's the work of the Lord to have that established in our lives. And for me personally, as one of the things I will feel to share more as we go on is some of my story, I know the Lord had a kickstart in my life, a miraculous turnaround, but even then there was still a progression that has to take place. So it's a continual growth in the Lord. It's a continuation. So even if we get those moments in our lives where we're set free of things and we have a kickstart, if you will, there's always a process in the Lord. And so I ask that we be teachable, that we be malleable in the hands and the presence of the Lord. That I, that I know that as some of the things Bob is getting on uh, the different teachings that he's already had in the days gone by, the book that he's written on the different, the cells of the, uh, the body and the, the different DNA and all the different things that he's wrote, wrote on in the trumpet series and all the things, these are teachings that the Lord gives us that are anointed. Uh, we look at Preston Eby's writings. We look at Elwin Roach. We look at all these marvelous writers. And so I believe that the Lord's taken a time out in Bob and I's heart to say, teach on some things. We're still going to have the Sunday service, and it, and it may include some teaching as well, and that's all right. But we're still going to have the praise. We're going to have the worship. We're going to have the moment of, of just the, more the traditional services still. We're going to be hosting some meetings this year with the, the church uh, conference for the kids, the, the youth gathering, uh, the Kingdom Family Conference, and also um, in Salisaw, the House of Lords hosting those meetings. So we're still gathering as a people. We're still having what you would consider to be uh, in gatherings and meetings because that's needed. But there also has to be a people that are grown up in the ways of the Lord. That's what I see this year is that there's going to be a maturity upon the people of God that it's maybe never seen. I think there's been some sons that have reached a place of maturity, but as a whole, there's still been a lot of, uh, to put it <laughs> probably bluntly, a lot of spoiled, rotten children still. <laughs> a bunch of sons that are just wanting to be sons to call themselves sons. Um, and we've all been there at moments. That's part of growth. As I said, we start somewhere and we grow up in the Lord. But now I believe our hearts are desiring to see something greater in the Lord to no longer be settling for the things that a child would settle for, just to have a little bit of a oohs and ahs and a little bit of experience. We're looking for the greater things of the Lord, the more excellent way that, that Jesus spoke about us that we are going to partake of as a people. Because that's what he said, you know, paraphrasing, the, as great of things that he did, and he did miracles beyond our, um, you know, capabilities, way beyond what we could do, but he said he's going to endow us with power to do greater things. So that power that he has in store for us and that power that he's placed within us, that has power to overcome all these different topics that I'm going to talk about. But I feel in my heart that it wouldn't do justice to just sit there and say that power is in you. Believe hard enough for that to manifest. That's not, that's not how I see it operating in a people. That there's people that have come in the midst of us and have received healings and then they go back out and they struggle in life. And I'm going to get very brutally honest a lot of these teachings that we have to ask those questions. That if we're that people with this word, why is it that we've yet to touch some of these things? And I don't know clearly. I mean, I don't have the clear answer. But I think we have to look at things in reality. That's the biggest step of all the problems that we're going to talk about is being able to look at things for how they are. So I know that we are that people that carry the message of Jesus Christ, the kingdom, the present kingdom, that we are sons, they were born unto the Father, that we have a sonship lineage directly to the Father. So I know that to be true. We believe in reconciliation of all mankind. We believe in these truths. But still there's yet to be that exceeding 
power that Jesus had manifest itself within the people. Jesus had the ability to heal these things. He still has this ability. The difference is instead of him being a man walking the earth, he's hidden this ability. And where he's hidden it is within you and within me. And now it's that time where he's beginning to cultivate something up out of us that's going to allow that to be released unto a people. So hallelujah. So I do, I do plan to, to speak on some of these things and hopefully begin to release some things in a people. Um, I, I, I really do. And, and that's going to take the Lord because these are topics that get talked about by professionals that have way far more knowledge than I do. Um, you know, I've been training now. I, I've been in the field of recovery for, I guess, a little bit over five years. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor, um, work out at the Ranch Recovery Center in Dick, uh, Nunley, Tennessee. And so, I mean, I, I have some understanding. I have some knowledge about a little bit of everything whenever it comes to addiction. Um, I like to say I know a little bit of everything, not a lot of anything. <laughs> Keeps me in the right place. But I have learned a little bit about all of it because out there we treat a little bit of everything. So I've seen humanity at its worst. I'll be honest. I've seen... Um, horror stories come through there. I've seen things, and, and I, I know we all have, but that's what I deal with on a daily basis is people that have hit the lows, beyond the lows, people that have never gotten a chance in life, that from day one they never had a chance. But the flip side, I've seen some miraculous healings out there. Um, and it didn't come, believe it or not, from going down to a building somewhere and saying the right prayer and kneeling at an altar. It came from the most crucial element of all this, is they established a relationship with God. They established a spiritual connection and an understanding. And they took all the doors off of, I don't have to believe like I was taught to always I had to believe so that I don't end up where people don't want me to go. And that's why we need to get beyond on all these topics. We need to set the religion aside and look at them for what they are. Because we've done that with our doctrines. We've done that with a lot of other things when it comes to the kingdom. But we've yet to expand our borders not only mental health, addiction, but I believe with physical health too. We still get a lot of the old mentality about, I must be doing something wrong. Uh, what can I do better? What can I do this way? And there are things that we can do to help mental and physical health. I'm all for that. I agree. We need to exercise. We need to eat better. Uh, we need to take care of our mindset. We need to uh, talk with people to, to, to vent and do those things. I'm all for that. But at the end of the day, there's only one perfect one. So we're going to hit places in life where we need answers. And so that's where I hope to set some foundations of where is the answer. We know it's Jesus, but the answer isn't a Jesus that left the earth 2,000 years ago to go somewhere far away, and now we only have a Holy Spirit to communicate with and to have an experience with so that one day Jesus is going to return to help us. That's not how I see this thing. I see that Jesus appeared on the scene offered himself up on the cross and began to start something in the midst of mankind where he's so intimate with this thing that if we, I believe we're starting to get that picture. I believe we're really, we've known Jesus, the Christ within, the hope of glory. We get that. But I think now he's making himself known to us that that dimension's within us. This more excellent way, that greater dimension resides right here in the midst of us. So, so, so I believe that. Um, and, to, and to just go ahead and continue on, I believe that, that when it comes to humanity, I don't believe there are bad people. I believe that nature gets a hold of people, carnal nature, sinful nature, or carnal nature that uh, causes sinful acts. I believe that. I believe that um, the beastly nature can take over a person, cause them to do horrendous things. But it's hard for me to believe that there's good people and bad people, and there's certain people that have no hope at all, that they have did too much for Jesus to ever redeem. I can't believe that. Um, if that's the Jesus we have, that Jesus isn't all-knowing and all-powerful. And so that's not the Jesus I want to minister to you in the midst of these situations. I want to minister a Jesus that does have the keys to everything, hell, death, and the grave, a Jesus that can overcome anything, but also a Jesus that doesn't fix all our problems for us right when we want him to. A Jesus that knows what we need better than we know. <laughs> a Jesus that is mature enough to know when we need have something dealt with and when it needs to stay in our life a little bit longer until we get 
uh, the lesson maybe or whatever it might be because there's dealings and processings which are going to be um, a whole other subject. And so I hope that tonight we'll, I can get a clear, clear focus, clear picture because I do want it to be an introductory, but I do hope to teach on a little bit of stuff too. But I just want to share my heart tonight more than anything. I want to give a good understanding of what's in my heart as well as what the Lord's shown me and helped me with in the years gone past. As I said, been in the field for a little bit over five years, seen a lot, got licensed as a drug and alcohol abuse counselor, been ordained now through the House of the Lord since 2013. And the Lord has done things in my life as well as being able to see other people go through things. So a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about, um, I, I feel sometimes you can speak out of experience really, really well. So a lot of things I'm going to speak to you about are going to be experience. Um, I, you know, I've lived a life to where I've been through hell and back, as many of us have. Um, I know that there's going to be many that begin enjoying these, these teachings that have been through the same hells I've been through, maybe deeper ones. I, I, I know that's out there. I'm not ignorant to think um, that, I've, that I've had the toughest road. So I hope that through my experience and, and, you know, all the fellowships most people go to for help with this, that's what they do is they share their hope and experience and strength. That's what I hope to do in the Lord is share my experience, share my hope, share my strength because it's got me through the toughest of times. It's got me set on a path to where the things that used to affect me don't affect me the same way they used to. I have a whole list of problems that I can make out and talk about those but there's a whole list of problems that have been dealt with through the care of the Lord, through the, through the nature of the Lord. So with, with a lot of this, I do want to, as I said, go through a bunch of uh, different topics. One of those primarily being addiction that I'm going to get catapulted with tonight. I'm going to get kicked off on that. Um, but we're just going to see where the thing goes. I was talking to James Bubba Hudson earlier and, um, love that man. <laughs> I really do. He's like a, uh, it's weird, D big age gap, but we're like brothers is the best way to put it. Um, you know, he's a father figure in a lot of ways, but at the same time, we're like brothers. Um, you know, we are, have a very awesome relationship, but we were talking about the endless possibilities. Um, I'm hoping to have, and Bob and I have felt this for a long time now that I'm hoping to have other ministries join in. And we have the capabilities technology-wise to even do videos and allow them to even know we're going live, play those right in the middle of the service. If we have interviews, if we have whatever it may be. So as the Lord leads, I'm hoping to have, because I, I believe that the body needs each other. I don't believe that one or two men had the answers for all the body. I believe that we need a, a well-rounded knowledge, a well-rounded experience of the things people have been through. So that's where I see this thing going to be a little bit different is it may be a little bit more casual feeling than a traditional service. And that's all right. Um, as I said, I would pray that you're still able to feel the spirit in the midst of it because I, I see that the spirit is wanting to infiltrate this realm to where I believe it's going to start creating a new feeling in our lives. That I believe that we've had that dividedness as man always have has where it's spirit and flesh, and we're wrestling with that. But I believe there's an in the middle to where the spirit begins to change the flesh into something different. That's the new creation, is where it compounds itself into one thing altogether. So I hope that we can begin to enter into a realm with this thing to where it may not feel the same as it's always felt, but that it's spirit changing some of the ways we uh, experience God in our everyday life. I hope that, this, that these teachings can begin to give us a knowledge and understanding of our Lord that begins to really impact us, to begin to see things change. Because if that's where I'm at with everything, even the services, if we can't see our lives change, we're not being fed anything. Because as we're being fed the truths of God, that should be changing us from the inside out. I believe that that should be changing the very essence, the very nature of who and what we are when we minister about the Word of God, when we begin to live out of that. Because that's not old moldy bread. That's not, even if it's scripture, as I'm going to read some tonight, that was written 2,000 years ago, um, it's not stale. <laughs> it has life in it. 
So that's what I'm here to minister is life. In the midst of all this, and I know some of these topics are going to be controversial to some church folks because they don't want to talk about them. That's talking about the things that aren't um, glorious. Well, this is where people are at, though. As I said, plenty of people I know that have family members sitting there dying and struggling with it, and there are no answers um, that we have. Again, we can default back to Jesus always. Um, but I feel that, and, I, and that's what part of me, to clarify, I feel, is that I feel Jesus is ready to equip us with the answers. I do. I feel that, that he is ready and is giving us over that ministry to begin to unlock some of these things that couldn't be unlocked before the time and the season. Maybe in bits and pieces. I know there's been healings and addictions in the past. I know there's been healings and things. But I believe that there's a ministry forming that, that is going to have the answers the church hasn't had. It's going to have the answers psychologists haven't had. That has the answers medical doctors haven't had. Because they've ministered, and that's where I was seeing about the spirit acting on this realm. They've ministered from the soul realm and they've ministered from the natural realm. But we, as the sons of God, hopefully we can begin to minister out of that spiritual realm unto this realm. Not just get caught up in the heavens and hope everybody else can get there with us. Hallelujah. So I do, I want to go on over to a little bit about addiction. Um, and again, not sure, I, I do a lot of this group out at the ranch. So I'm not going to, I'm going to modify a little bit. Um, I don't plan to maybe do it all as in depth in different things that I would out there because it's, it's a different need. I, I do feel, um, I, I'm going to pull up here a few, a few of these scriptures to have ready. I got, I got a few of them. And I've, I've talked about some of this stuff, bits and pieces and interwoven it into some of the messages I've ministered in the past. So some of those that have followed us, you may have heard some of these things. But I've been teaching this one specific group about the disease now for, I don't know, three years. And it's just like scriptures. You've read them before, you've read them before, and then now all of a sudden today it means something totally different to you. Um, so every time I teach this group, every time I hear a little bit more, it begins forming new concepts, new connections, new understanding. Um, for me because I've gained more knowledge I've gained more insight so now I say that I thought I understood that and this is where I want to relate to spiritually we thought we understood this but now we can really understand it because the Lord's prepared us now to hear these things so even though we've known Jesus is the answer I believe we're going to begin to understand more of why is Jesus the answer what what makes his substance and nature the answer to humanity and that's been spoken about some. I believe that that's not just an um, external thing that Jesus did and we're waiting for him to come back. Like I said, that's an internal thing that Jesus implanted within our very nature. That he overcame some things in the natural man that gives us a power internally to begin to overcome these things ourselves. So I want to turn over to Genesis, the second chapter. And this is something that, that I have spoke about, and, and, and I'm going to refer to uh, Preston Eby's webpage here because he wrote about it, and um, gosh, who knows? Oh, actually, it's right there. How many? He has 39 writings on it, <laughs> so he covers it a lot more expansive and more eloquently than I could. But it's from his Echoes of Eden series, and he really talks about where we came from. Where did humanity come from? And he addresses the whole story of Eden in the garden. And he begins to talk about the different things within there, the, the, the different symbologies. And, and he's one of the great writers when it really comes to pulling revelation out of sometimes you're thinking, where in the world did he get that from? Because it's one scripture that has several pages written on it. And you're thinking, I read that scripture and 29 others, and I didn't even get anything out of all 30 of them. So it's like Preston has the ability to have insight where some can't have insight. He's really been given that gift. But I do want to flip over to Genesis 2, um, and then I'll give you the uh, name of his website and link. That way, if, you're, if you want to do a more in-depth study on this first little part that I talk about, I would really encourage you to read his Echoes of Eden series. But in the second verse of Genesis, 
the eighth, um, second chapter, eighth verse. It says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it talks about those trees there. And I say this often, I don't want to debate whether Eden was a literal place somewhere or if this was just a symbolic story. But I do want to talk about the spiritual significance of this, that the Lord planted a garden in Eden, and we are that garden. We are that place that he planted within us some trees that it says the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it talks about and all the other trees of the garden. And what Preston talked about, and I'll be honest, this is one of the first writings I really started reading whenever I, I came into this message. I started reading this series because it was intriguing whenever I read that first part. Um, and I'd never seen Genesis. I mean, you know, you grow up going to church and you hear all these stories about creation and all that, but he had a way of breaking it down where it was just mind-boggling. And so he goes on to talk about that these are uh, a few different things being the three elements of man, body, spirit, and soul, that all the trees of the garden represent the body, that the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents the soul realm, and that the spirit realm is represented by that tree of life. But then also, that tree of life representing Christ in the midst of us. He himself, he's the only life giver. <laughs> We begin to give life as he gives us life, but he is that tree of life planted in this garden. But it talks about that other tree, that knowledge of good and evil. So as I said, I believe that every man is, is, is good in nature. The reason I say that is because in the beginning, as so if we were in Jesus, and it says the word was, was God and the word was with God, that means that we have a nature tied directly to God, that Jesus is our elder brother, and that's why we call him elder brother. He identified with son of man, but he also said, I am the, I am the son. And so through that, that gives us a lineage into the father. So by that, that means that we're the offspring of God. And you see that paralleled throughout the scriptures through uh, the nation of Israel, Abraham's seed, all the different things. It, it symbolically represents that. We are those, that people, not just this select group of people that, that understand kingdom truths, as we would call it, but all creation. I don't see, if everything was created out of the word, I don't, I don't see how, even if you're a theologian and could debate this, I don't see how you get anything outside of Jesus at that point. If everything was created in him and by him and through him, everything has to have its roots and lineage traced back through Jesus. Not just the natural man, Jesus, but the Christ, the anointing, the word. That expressive word that was in God that created all things. So that's where our lineage is. That's where the tree of life is. That's who the tree of life is. So that being said, we're all born out of that. We all come from the Father into this realm. That we're present in the Father until we get lowered into this dimension. And when I say lowered, I don't mean necessarily from somewhere out there. And this is a topic that may be covered later. I don't want to spend too much time, but the dimensions of God, there's a greater dimension than this natural dimension we're operating in. But we get lowered into this limited dimension that's bound by space and time and matter into a physical mortal body that was formed from the dust of the earth as it talks about the creation of man in Genesis. That it was formed from the dust of the earth. There you see all the other trees of the garden, that body. But then that life-given spirit that we were born from, so that's why I say all men are good. All men have that nature in them. All men have, in the psych psychology world, they call it the true self. They call it the authentic self. All people have that, they believe. And then in the scripture, it tells us that he breathed into the nostrils of this man 
and created a living soul, a living being. So we get a soul realm there. We get that knowledge of good and evil. Because as Adam ate of that tree, it wasn't that something new happened. It was that he became aware of what was already there. Just as when we come in contact with the Lord for the first time, it wasn't that the Lord just appeared on the scene. It wasn't that a spirit swooped down and entered into our life. We became aware of what was already there. And I feel that word so strongly for these teachings. I hope we become aware of what's in here, aware of what we have access to. And hopefully that gets unlocked for some. And even myself, I'm not saying this like I have all the answers. I hope Jesus unlocks some doors for me because I have things that still need healed. I have a greater need for Jesus. And if somebody doesn't have a greater need for Jesus, I'd like them to, you know, let me know because that would be hard for me to believe that anybody out there doesn't have a greater need for Jesus in their life. But we see in the scriptures here, as we're going through Genesis, that it talks about that. And so I look at it as you begin to see these two natures, that you have the outer man, the natural man, and the inner man, the spiritual man, that you have an inner house and an outer house. And Paul talks about it in Corinthians uh, later on, about this tent be destroyed, there's an inner house, inner tabernacle. So you see that written throughout the scriptures. But in that inner man, that is something that has a different nature than the outer man. It comes from a place that's not bound by space and time, that's not bound by the limits we have in this room. And then you have your natural body that's very bound. <laughs> it needs blood flow. It needs gravity to keep it held together. It needs all these elements to just keep it going. It needs heat. It needs uh, cooling at times. It needs whatever it needs to stay alive. It's extremely bound. It's really fragile if you were to truly understand. And people get freaked out by this. You get the germophobic people and the different people that they start realizing I mean, it's a miracle. If you want to talk about I've never seen a miracle, just study the body and think about how do I make it through X amount of years of my life. It's a miracle that God keeps us alive every day. That's miraculous. Only God could create such a complex organism called human beings just in the physical sense and make that thing work. But anyway... We have the natural man that operates in its lower nature, and we have the spiritual man. So I believe that we truly are spirit, but we're also flesh, and that there's two natures that we can live out of. And so I believe people are born living out of that spiritual nature until they begin to learn of that carnal nature, just as Adam did. He was born spiritual, had fellowship with the Father, walked with the Father, until he became aware of that nature that was within him. And that's when he began to be subjected unto vanity, to be subjected unto the lower things. He became aware that they were naked, him and Eve. They began to be lustful, probably. They began to seek after gratification and pleasure. And it doesn't lay all this out in the scripture. I just trust me. Like I said, from experience, I know the nature of man. We all do. <laughs> that's where we come from, Adam, in the natural. So we know that nature. That's the nature that gets a hold of us. And with the, the disease of addiction, that's where I want to talk about. That's where that springs forth up out of is that nature. All along that spiritual nature is in communion with the Father. But we begin to forget what that is and become disconnected from that and begin to identify with this natural sense of who we are. I'm told by everybody, my name is... Uh, Zachary Lane Reagan, I'm going to fit this mold. I grew up in this family system. I do this. This is how you be successful in life. This is how you get by. This is how you do X, Y, Z. You go to school. You learn all your stuff. Until one day I realized there's a greater truth than what society has been teaching me. There's something beyond all this, something that's in the midst of all of it that until God unlocked my eyes to it, I didn't even know it was there. So that opened my eyes to that spiritual inner man that as many things as I've done in my addiction that I look back at and say, I would never do those things, I did them. I was blinded to the other truth. And now it's the exact opposite. I say, I can't believe I would do those things and I couldn't even do them today. There's another nature at play. The nature of our Lord, the nature that operates from that tree of life. 
that life-giving nature. So I want to get there that there's two natures. There's the Adamic nature that causes us to sin, and there's the spiritual nature that's the Christ-like nature. And so my mind goes 20 different directions with that, and I'm going to try to stay on course here because there's a lot to cover in these topics, um, let alone explain addiction, but also with, with all the spiritual implications of it. But with the two natures, we have those. We begin to learn of one, and I mentioned the word sin, and I believe this is something that needs to be defined properly for the subjects. The way I would like to summarize sin is that sin means to miss the mark when you get to breaking it down in the lexicons. That, that sin doesn't mean I went and drank, I went and cussed, I went and smoked. That's what we define sin as, is all oh, went and sinned again, I'm a bad person. That's the idea we got to get away from because that's not... Um, that's the mentality that, that religious systems teach us to have that keeps us in those shame spark, spark, cycles, that keeps us in those guilt trips. The mentality we have to have is that when I operate out of that lower nature, it causes me to miss the mark. That I'm not acting like my elder brother. I'm not operating out of the nature of Jesus. So yes, going and doing those things would be in relation to sin, but sin for me is operating out of the wrong nature. Because that's where all of it springs forth from. And that's what I want to get to is that sin for me, that Adamic nature, is that other tree that's within our garden. And it has a root to it that's in all humanity. It's been placed. If you've sinned, <laughs> you can join the club. We've all been there. We've all done it. That's part of us having a lineage to Adam. And I look at that as a, a root that's in all humanity that begins to have this stalk and branches that spring forth from it in all of our lives. And all that looks different because everybody has their own things. But I believe addiction to be one of those branches that branches out from that. That the root cause is that nature. That we begin to miss the mark and sin out of operating out of that lower nature through addiction. So I believe addiction to be not a bad person doing bad things. It's hard for me to believe that. I believe somebody's mindset's been taken over. I believe that maybe they've even believed themselves that they're a bad person. I see that all the time, that they're completely convinced while they're all messed up on drugs and alcohol. They think that their life's over. They might as well throw it all away, they, that God can't ever forgive them. <coughs> I've been there myself. I've thought not as much about the God part because that wasn't even on my radar <laughs> until he smacked me right in the head and woke me up to it. But I just started thinking, well, you know, I'm a bad person. This is what, you know, bad people do. That's what we tell ourselves out of that lower nature. So I see addiction as something that springs forth up out of that sinful nature. All disease, I believe, to be out of that nature. Physical, mental, all these things. Um, that none of that can be in that inner man. That inner man can't be uh, sick and diseased. It can't be bound to the things that our natural man's bound to, that our soulish man's bound to. Because I see the soul as a mediator, that it's right in the middle of these things, and it can either be bound to the uh, natural, Adamic things, or it can be bound to the spiritual things. So I believe that whenever our soul becomes bound to natural things, such as substances, we get in the place of hell, because that's what hell is, is it a state where you're disconnected from the God. Because if you're connected with God and seeing the light, it's hard to be in a place of darkness while you're seeing a true light. Um, now, there's more to come on that because there's experience. There's different levels of hell, but I mean the hell like you would think of of being in um, utter darkness. That's the type of hell I'm talking about. Not going through just a trial, um, not going through a processing and a dealing, but creating, creating things in our life that are a living hell. Hallelujah. So I do want to go on over to this. Um, I pulled up that scripture in Genesis. But I want to get through this because I don't want to keep us too long tonight. Um, I will go for a little longer.
But I want to get here to um, addiction. And I may show some up on the screen. Right now, I'm just going to read through some of the stuff I have. Uh, but I'm going to show some maps and images of the brain. I'm going to do some explanation. Um, I, I'm hoping that, that you receive it as I understand it. Um, so addiction itself, and this is going to be speaking about all addiction, not just drug and alcohol. That addiction define, and, and, and I get a lot of the stuff from uh, Kevin T. McCauley is one of the medical doctors that I've watched. He has a video out there, Pleasure Unwoven, um, has some stuff he's written. I believe works with, um, well, I better not say, I think it's the Meadows, but I'm not 100% sure on that as a uh, consultant. But as a medical doctor who was an alcoholic himself and began asking a question when they said, it's a disease. He said, well, I'm a medical doctor. Why don't I know it's a disease? The reality is, is they don't teach people about it. Even in medical school, you would think they know all about it. They don't teach them about it. Um, it's really been an undertaught subject, even in the medical community. But it says, addiction defined. I'm going to read this up front, and then we're going to walk you through the parts. It says, it's a stress-induced defect acting on a genetic vulnerability and the reward learning areas of the midbrain and emotional choice areas of the frontal cortex. So that's where I want to hear in a minute, show some pictures, because I know a lot of people, some people can learn by hearing, but seeing some of this is going to help register some of the, some of the different areas of the brain. So at the time, I got some of the stats, it was 2012, showed about 10% of all American adults ages 18 and older to consider themselves to be in recovery from a drug and alcohol. So, you know, anybody that's ever took any stats classes, anybody that knows that stuff knows there's a few different keys to that. How did you get the stats? Um, how'd you do your study? All the different types of questions that get raised. And so out of that population that they got to poll, about 10% said they were in recovery. And that's only from drugs and alcohol because that was according to the New York, off, uh, New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. But there's many, many more addictions than drug and alcohol. And so these are people that are in recovery from drug and alcohol, but this number holds true to most that I see about 10% of people. So it's a, it's a epidemic, it's a problem. And a lot of us know about the new rise with opiates and the opioid epidemic that's killing people left and right. Um, and that's why I feel to do some of this because I, I hope that, that us even as a spiritual people can begin to have some understanding that's gonna help some of these people. They may not hear what we have to say spiritually, but that we can begin to minister to on another level. So theories of addiction. Um, one, of the, one of the prominent theories that still holds true in society is that this idea of choice theory, that people just make the, cho the choice to use, that they choose their fate, so if you want to correct them, you punish them, and they're going to learn their lesson, and they're going to quit using. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about it, but as you know, if you've dealt with somebody that's addicted, punishing doesn't work. Uh, not that there doesn't need to be consequences. Hear me on that. There needs to be consequences. There needs to be accountability. But just because somebody gets a DUI and they take their license, I've seen plenty of people still not quit drinking. Uh, I've seen plenty of people lose their job. They still don't quit sleeping around with other people. Um, plenty of people that um, get hospitalized. I heard, heard this more than seen, but um, people that get hospitalized with eating disorders. They still don't stop restricting or overeating. So consequences aren't always enough. Just punishing people to, to say stop doing it isn't the answer. But that's how you would react to a choice theory. It says in the 1930s, when researchers first began to investigate what caused addictive behavior, they believed that people who developed addictions were somehow morally flawed or lacking in willpower. Overcoming addiction, they thought, involved punishing addicts or alternatively encouraging them uh, to break the habit. So they looked at it as more of being a habitual process where people just build the habit. And if we could just punish them or encourage them enough to quit, they'll quit. I'll use cigarettes as a simple example. Um, I know a lot of people that would die to quit smoking. They would, 
They've tried it time and time again. They don't even get a lot of pure payoff from it. It's not even like getting high in the sense of somebody using drugs and alcohol where they get to escape mentally and do all this. But they can't break that chain. They can't break that cycle. So the other theory, which really isn't even a theory, um, the disease model is very scientifically proven and backed, and it's widely accepted by the medical community, um, although a lot of them don't have the training and the understanding it takes to truly treat it in a, in a sense. It recognizes addiction as a chronic disease that changes both brain structure and function. Just as cardiovascular disease damages the heart and diabetes impairs the pancreas, addiction hijacks the brain. This happens as the brain goes through a series of changes, and these are the big things to know with addiction. It begins with the recognition of pleasure and ending with the drive toward compulsive behavior caused by a drug. So in the end, it seems like a habit, that they're so trained to do this, this is just what they do. Um, but it, it becomes more than that, and we can see that with the brain. And as I said, we're going to go to, here in a minute, some pictures that, that the brain rewires itself to seek this over everything. And you can see that just in the actions of somebody dealing with addiction. The drug becomes more important to them than even their own children, their own spouse, their job, their career, not just the job, but their career that they've maybe worked 20 years on. The drug becomes more important than that. It becomes more important than God to them. In reality, the drug becomes their God, that they lose all sense of connection with anything besides that drug. One of the tr things we treat out there are intimacy disorders. We have a program, um, the Center for Relationship and Sexual Recovery, and a large part of that's treating intimacy disorders. But in reality, any type of addiction, food, um, I went through my gambling, shopping, alcohol and drugs, sex, all those things are intimacy disorders. The person isn't comfortable having their own experience. They can't be intimate even with themselves. So it not only does it seem like they don't care about their kids, they don't care about their job. They get to where they don't even care about themselves anymore. They can't have uh, Mick Jagger. <laughs> I quote him a lot. Bear with me, all those people that don't like rock and roll. Sorry, I said Mick Jagger. Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones wrote in his book, he was talking about doing heroin, and he said, it's not just about feeling good, and it's a lot of paraphrasing here, but he said it's the contortions he put himself through just to not be himself for a little while. It wasn't that he wanted to get high to go have a good time. He didn't want to be himself. That's why he used heroin. It was about escape. And that's what largely all this is about, is it's about escape because it's too painful to be themselves. So you talk about being in a hell to where when it's so unbearable, where you have no self-esteem, no sense of worth, no sense of anything, that it's too painful to even be yourself. So the disease model looks like, um, and Bob, you may be able to zoom in for just a second on this, then we'll go back to um, me talking. Looks like, I want to make sure we keep the audio going, that we have here that it says uh, the disease model is an organ that has a defect that's giving you symptoms. And that disease model applies to all disease, whether it's, um, you know, I don't know. You, you go down them. The, the, the example I have is diabetes, because this is one that most common people have an understanding of what's going on, where it's the pancreas not producing insulin that gives a loss of sight or numbness. Where the disease model came into play was in the 19, uh, 1930s, around the same time that they began to understand the thing about the disease of addiction, they were asking themselves, what causes disease and how do we treat disease? Because we're treating people, but it's not highly effective. Um, some of the methods they were doing, as we know, the, the mortality rate um, 
you know, it's changed nowadays. There's more people surviving disease and there's more people through vaccinations and all the, and I understand some of this stuff gets controversial for people. So I'm not here to <laughs> politically side anyway. It's just the reality that they're creating ways for people that people are living longer. Um, common things like diabetes. It used to be if somebody had this where they were having loss of sight numbness, they may just ask them to lie down for a little while till they get over it, till they get through it. Now we know if you give them insulin, um, their pancreas begins to operate the healthy way. So used to the way the medical community worked is they would, they would chase symptoms a lot. They would say, here's a symptom, let's chase it, try to treat it. But it wasn't healing anything, it wasn't helping anything. So they began to say, let's look at the defect. What's really going on here? And they believe that by doing gross anatomy procedures, because it's crazy to think now we live in the day where we have microbiology and all the ways to look at all that stuff. It used to be gross anatomical procedures where they could dissect something, look at organs, but they didn't even understand how these organs really work. Um, I believe uh, Bob wrote about it in his book, and he correct me if I'm wrong, about the brain being essentially like a radiator that cools things. Um, at one time, that's what they thought of it as being. They didn't really understand how complex the brain was. So nowadays, we have all this knowledge, and we think it's crazy. But at one point, even the, the leading medical experts didn't understand how things worked. So they said, we believe organs are having defects, giving us symptoms. So an addiction, here's that definition, and we're still going to break it down some more. They look at the brain, specifically the midbrain, has a stress-induced hedonic dysfunction. And what the hedonic system is, is the pleasure system in the brain. We're going to talk about that. That gives people the symptoms we see of loss of control, cravings, persistent use despite consequences. So let me go because I want to try to skip through some things. Uh, so the pleasure center, a lot of people have heard about that in the brain. The medical terms, the nucleus accumbens. It's a cluster of nerve cells lying, lying in the brain, that uh, in the cerebral cortex of the brain, that or underneath the cerebral cortex that are where the two uh, dopamine centers, if you will, are at. One of the things that dopamine's key for, it, it helps with a few things, memory, learning. Um, people that have Parkinson's have altered levels to where it's low, to where they shake, they, the motor function gets affected. But one of them largely is it tells me something's good, feels good. It's good for my survival from an evolutionary standpoint. So the, let me see if I can get, yeah, this larger picture here is that you have the midbrain there and the nucleus accumbens is a small part of the midbrain. And that's where that pleasure center is, where dopamine gets released from. So we experience something, whether it be um, putting a drug into our body and through a chemical reaction, it releases dopamine if it's something that we perceive to be good for us, if it's a monetary reward, if we get a bonus at work, um, anything that equates to pleasure, um, and it can be tangible or intangible, it could be behavior or it can be a substance. Anything we do, we begin to release that chemical called dopamine. And so with dopamine, it's released out of the nucleus accumbens and it's tied to uh, evolutionary uh, biologists and psychologists and the, the people get more into the evolutionary standpoint of it um, and look at very primitive functions. So again, I'm not here to debate evolution, whatever. I'm here to say that I know that there's an animalistic nature in us. And so that's what I relate this to. The animalistic part of us uses that system in our brain to say um, three primary things. Food. Every time I eat food, I release dopamine. It says it's good for me. It's keeping me alive. So my brain wants to do that to keep me alive. You got to eat. Um, sex to re reproduce, to repopulate. Um, humankind wouldn't be here without reproduction, any animal species. So the brain's naturally driven to seek reproduction cycles. And then the kill sense, which a lot of people know as it, and, I, and I'll probably get into this more in another lecture about the fight and flight sense in the brain. So it's that whole sense of if I'm being attacked, I need to be able to defend myself. So we begin to release dopamine um, 
through through getting this thing activated, along with a lot of other chemicals, adrenaline, different things to fight back. But we have to have certain things that our brain recognizes as this has to be a good experience to keep me alive. So there's another chemical called glutamate. There's going to be three basic chemicals I lay out, dopamine, and a lot of people have heard about a lot of neurochemicals. Um, a lot of this stuff's becoming pop culture even, like the old pleasure center concept. A lot of people hear about that a lot now. But glutamate's the other chemical that glutamate helps store memories. So if I have an experience, and this isn't even just drugs and alcohol, anything, say that um, I had a good day at work. My brain, uh, you have short-term, long-term, all the different types of memory. My brain's going to weigh out how important was this to me. Do I need to remember it? Um, sometimes we don't even know why we remember stuff, but for some reason our brain counted it as important. So you think of uh, birthday parties. You've had plenty of them, but there's probably one or two that you especially remember. Christmases, that you've had the best Christmas. Whatever it may be, your brain registered as that, that being very rewarding. <clears throat> and it could be not just because it was a gift, but maybe it was a certain person that was there. Maybe it was um, a certain time in your life where you were really happy. Could be the opposite, where it's very traumatic. And your brain remembers that. And it kicked on that. That's where that kill sense comes into play is that it's not good that it happened, but your brain remembers, I need to make sure to avoid that next time because I got to stay alive. I can't put myself back there. So traumatic events, your brain kicks on to recognize those to say, I got to keep myself out of those situations. And all the defense mechanisms and all that's another topic too because that's really an area that needs a lot of clarification. But with just addiction... You release dopamine, it tells you something's good for you. You begin to release glutamate to remember it. <clears throat> so where glutamate stored, we can come back over for a second. I think I'm about done shifting back and forth here, so uh, I'll let Bob uh, coast along at the end. <laughs> Quit putting him so much work here. But in the midbrain, there is what's called the limbic system, which is essentially all this area around here that stores memories, and this is where glutamate helps put memories there. So a lot of our memories, actually some people believe that everything we ever experience is locked away in our brain somewhere. A lot of people even think while we're in the womb, we begin storing memories and that those things stay with us. We can't access them, but they're down there somewhere because the heart and the brain are the first things to develop. And whenever the brain's there, it starts formulating memories um, again, another topic, but innate memory that our body has, we might not recognize that in our frontal part of the brain up here where we mostly do our thinking, but our body remembers things that we can't remember consciously or that one day we might recall through a certain events that happen. Um, just like if we were to walk into, you know, I don't know, if I walked into the house I grew up in, I may start having memories I hadn't had in a long time. It's that same concept. There's certain different things spatially and all the different ways that recall things to us. So they get locked away in our brain. So with drugs, it causes an excessive amount of dopamine to release in the brain that says this is really, really important. And that's through, um, I mean, if every drug's traced back to a plant, including methamphetamine, there's ephedrine in it. So there's a lot of other chemicals that are, that are synthetic, but it has to have some type of ephedra in it from the ephedrine plant. Everything has a root nature in a plant. So our body naturally is going to release something because it's food. And as crazy as it sounds, it has some sense of a chemistry to it that, that it's not life-given, <laughs> but it's like a food. As all food, there's poisonous food. Um, but we take it, and our brain's naturally supposed to release a certain amount of dopamine, the most it's supposed to release naturally is a uh, sexual experience and reproduction because without that, as I said, that's the basis for all life is to reproduce. Um, you can skip a few meals and still be alive, but if you go generations without reproduction, the human species no longer exists. So we get that naturally, but what drugs do is they begin to elevate that to where we release more than we're supposed to release. So dopamine along with other chemicals, endorphins and several others, creates this euphoria in the brain. It creates this larger-than-life experience, this greater um, sense of self sometimes for people, this greater, aha, this is what I've been looking for. If I've experienced an extreme amount of pain in my life and not been able to process that and go through that, so I, dr I, I try drugs, that's like ultimate pain relief. 
That's why you see so many people getting on opiates because they do act on endorphins too, but also dopamine. And that's like the ultimate painkiller because people take opiates for physical pain, but in the brain, pain's registered physical and mental the same exact way. And so what do people want to do for pain? Escape pain. Nobody wants to be in pain. So even if it's a, a sincere start, and I hear this all the time, and I believe a lot of people, I started sincerely going to a pain clinic for my pain, but I got hooked and I couldn't get off because not only did they know they had physical pain, there was suppressed mental pain that they began to medicate with the medicine. So not the physical dependence, but also the mental dependence they built because this is the perfect way to escape all my problems and all my pain. I feel better about life because that's what those are intended to do. So not only prescribed medication, but any type of drug, it's going to create this euphoria to where you begin to release more dopamine than you're supposed to, and the, the glutamate is going to store those memories and lock that into place really strong because it's going to give the brain, and all this is unconscious. You're not sitting there saying, oh, this is so important to me for my survival. I better remember this, just as we don't every day. I don't sit there and say, I mean, some things we're like, yeah, I got to remember that. But every experience we have, unconsciously our brain's weighing out decisions all day long. Do I do this? Do I not do that? Do, uh, do I remember this? Do I not remember that? All that's going on unconsciously because that part of the brain I showed you, that's all unconscious. We don't, we access stuff from that, but we're not operating out of that part as far as our active, um, um, not memory, but our active thinking because that part of the brain is what people usually think of, that frontal part, that frontal lobe. That's where you make your decisions at. That's where you do all the complex thinking, the abstract thinking. So if it was a choice, that's what part of the brain we would be using. But we see that middle part is the part that becomes active in addiction. They can do scans, and I'm going to show some of those here in a second too, that show that whenever a drug's administered, that mid part of the brain's the part that gets affected. So it's not the front part that you would think, okay, if it's going to be a choice, they're going to choose to do it. That's the part that lights up. And they did a study with mice. I think about every time I start studying stuff, I'm thinking, these poor mice. <laughs> they get poked and prodded and given cocaine and everything. <laughs> you know, they, they get the brunt end of it. Um, but they, they did studies. It was called the Olds Experiments. And interesting enough, these guys were trying to prove that um, addiction was a choice. They said, it's a choice, and so we're going to prove you know, it out to be. So they set up mice in a cage and did a, a, did a few things with it that they, they, they gave them access to cocaine that was in a tray. They put an electric shock grate in front of the cocaine that they would, um, they put food in the corner. They let the mice go in the cage and they would administer small amounts to the mice to get them dependent on the cocaine. So they would do that and over time, that, the, the mice um, would actually stop going to eat and they would go over, step on that electric grate, and get shocked just to go get more of the cocaine. And so that in itself is the perfect picture of addiction. Um, I'm going to negate all my needs and put myself in pain just to keep getting this substance. It relieves my pain. So even though I'm creating more pain, making my life more miserable, I don't feel the effects of it because I get to escape through a drug. So through that process, while they're doing that, they would be uh, sticking microscopic, or I say microscopic, uh, very small prods into the mouse's brain. Um, the individual mice, they would, they would start monitoring. And they said, whenever we administer cocaine to it, we're going to put that in. And a mouse, uh, their brain's not as complex as a human brain, obviously. So they don't have as much of an advanced cortex like a human, which is the outside, the gray, part, gray matter part of the brain that most people think of, that... Um, they, they said they're going to take cocaine, we're going to stick the uh, sensor in there, and we're going to see that part of the brain light up. Well, they saw nothing happen. So they kept doing it, they kept moving the sensor around, and boom, they landed on that midbrain, that part that's the, uh, a lot of people call it the reptile brain, the, uh, they have different terminology for it, but the midbrain, and they saw that part light up. So what that told them is when that mouse got addicted to the cocaine, that it started negating all of its needs and it actually became more powerful than that front part of their brain, that that midbrain overrode all their body's needs, all the mental needs to say, okay, I'm trying to go get food. I'm trying to avoid pain. 
I'm going to keep this drug in my life at whatever it costs because that became more powerful to them, relieving pain than any other thing in their life. So I know this may be the first time some people hear it. I know it may be a lot to swallow. Um, But as much as we can get frustrated with people, as much as we get angry with them, these people are in way more pain than we could ever imagine. Way more pain than they could ever imagine. They can't look at it, and that's why they've had to escape, because it's too much for them to bear at once. And we're going to talk about family systems, too. I just want to keep kind of having those popcorn moments of tying in some different things to give a people an idea of what we're going to talk about. Not only, there's going to be some more scripture I bring in here, and again, I don't want to keep you too much longer. There's going to be the spiritual component that I hope to bring. But families, they got to experience the pain too, and that's a whole other topic that we'll cover is family systems. But real quick, going back uh, to the screen, I can't remember if I fibbed to Bob and told him the last time was the last or not, but i got one more little thing to show over here on the TV screen that, that we talked about the things being the, um, the stress-induced dysfunction. And by stress-induced, that doesn't mean um, that I had a hard day at work, now I became an addict. Stress means I have a disease, mental health disease, that, that contributes. I have traumatic events that happen to me. Because if the body experiences a traumatic event, the fight-and-flight response in itself is a stressful um, response in the body. Stress is actually a healthy thing in limited amounts because it gets your body to respond. But it's, we become too stressed. We activate that all day long. So we have a hedonic stress point in the brain. You know, we're taught that we have five senses. And it's actually not entirely true because there's a lot more senses the brain has. We have the ability to sense perception. I can tell how close something is to me. I have a balance, sense of balance. So I can tell... Um, Am I, am I off balance? All those type things. One of them is the pleasure sense. So am I in too much pain or am I content with life? So the third chemical I want to talk about, we talked about dopamine, glutamate, and then we got CRF, which is a hormone that's like the anti-reward chemical. Dopamine's reward, CRF is anti-reward. So dopamine makes me feel good. CRF, which is like cortisol, a lot of people know what that is, a stress hormone in the body. Whenever I get stressed, I release this anti-reward to tell me that something's kind of bad. So every organism has to maintain what's called homeostasis. And this can be in several different categories. This can be with temperature, which is the main thing people know, is that um, you have to maintain relatively 98.6 degree temperature. It can fluctuate a little bit, but it can't get too low and it can't get too high. Also, pH balance in the body has to maintain relatively the same pH balance. It can't get way too acidic, can't get way too basic. So in the body, or in the brain, it has this state that as pain induces, we begin to do pleasurable things to offset that pain. So if we looked at these upside down Vs as dopamine, and that line is CRF, there's this perfect intersection to where as we begin to experience pain, we can do normal things to relieve that pain. And for somebody not suffering from addiction, that would look like I had a hard day at work. I came home, talked to my spouse about it. I watched my favorite TV episode. Now I feel a little better. I go for a walk. I feel good. I come home, read scripture. I feel content again. I pray about it. I can get through it. it may not be all go away, but I can deal with it. I can cope with it. With an addict's brain, it goes into a state of what's called allostasis to where this bar has been raised Again, through mental health disease, through traumatic experiences, and trauma is for sure one of those topics we're going to talk about to define it properly, um, from um, extremely traumatic events to everyday traumas that we don't even probably realize are there. But a brain goes into a state of pain, and so these small dopamine releases we used to get um, no longer cut it. They're not loud enough, if you will. We become pleasure deaf to where things that once were pleasurable to us, we no longer get pleasure from anymore. We say, I need a lot of pleasure. And if you and I've been there again, and I know a lot of people that listen and have, that that's where you get the thrill-seeking behavior from, that hanging out at home on Friday night with the family is not enough. I need to go to the big party now. I need to go have a good time. That's what they start seeking out every day, is I need more fun. This isn't enough.
So with addiction, it does create this unconscious drive towards seeking a drug or a behavior. There's different addictions that begin to manipulate different chemicals, um, eating disorders, through somebody that purges and different things. Um, whenever you vomit, the, the brain, and I know some of these topics are like topics most people don't want to talk about. <laughs> but the reality is, as people deal with these, I mean, you want to talk about something horrible. Um, think about being uh, somebody that has an eating disorder and having to be around your biggest, uh, I mean, it's like for me, being somebody that's recovered from drugs and alcohol, I can easily say I'm not going to go to a bar and be around alcohol. I'm not going to go hang out with whoever, be around drugs. For somebody that struggles with food, and I'm not talking about just particular, about I like this too much or I eat a little too much sometimes. I'm talking about people that life, uh, deathbed, it, it has a high mortality rate on the people with eating disorders. A lot of people die from them, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that. Um, anorexics. I mean, that, shuts, that begins eating away at your bodies where their body actually begins depending on muscles um, for proteins. It begins eating away at their muscles. But what I was getting to is they're able to manipulate food intake and even through um, anorexics vomiting uh, or bulimics vomiting, um, they, it releases endorphins. It releases different chemicals in the brain. So there becomes a high with it. Just as you would think, okay, that's different from drugs and alcohol, there becomes a high to the brain uh, in it to where they actually get a high from it. Um, they would not have eaten for a day or two and go out and exercise and get all that endorphin release and experience that high instead of, um, instead of eating. So, I mean, it becomes an addiction in itself. Same thing with sex and um, gambling and all these different process addictions. All of them involve dopamine at the core of it, but they get into so much more with the brain. But they, they, an addict loses that ability to control these things. And so one of the scriptures I want to read is that in Romans 7, popular scripture, I think Paul puts it best, and I've read this before, that, let me get to the verse I want in chapter 7, verse 15, Paul writes, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So there's that, I parallel that sin is disease of addiction being out of that root of uh, that damnic nature that causes us to sin. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. And there's a lot of these, I, this scripture always gets me every time I read it. There's all these to do's and not to do's and... For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So that's where people get with addiction. It's no longer them operating. It's not that inner man. It's not that spiritual nature. That's where I want to go full circle back to this before I close here. That once their brain's been rewired to seek this drug, that natural man takes over their life to where that's all it can seek now. It loses access to that inner man. They become closed off from that, that they begin to find that connection with what used to be them accessing, or maybe they never have, but if they had, if they used to access that inner man and have a relationship with God, they become closed off to that. And just as Adam did, if you look at it, it's a perfect prototype what do you do? They begin to hide. What do we do whenever we get um, shameful? Because really that's what most of it is. We start doing stuff. I want to hide from God. I'm shameful. I regret these things. So you're going to hide from God. They become disconnected. Not that God leaves them. Not that God forsakes them. Not that the devil's gotten a hold of them too bad that they're forever lost. It's that they begin to no longer approach the throne of grace. Um, that, that, that this other thing has taken them over, literally. That it becomes bigger 
than a choice they can make. So Paul writes that about all sin and about all that nature. Um, but I believe that to be so true with addiction to where, and even Paul himself, a prime example of being Saul, legalistic, doctrinal, um, knowing the law, that became a new person, a new nature, a new purpose. That's where I see the transformation from the old nature into the new. And that's where we're at is that in addiction is that that lower nature is there, but we can have these moments with God where he gets a hold of us, where he begins to open our eyes to the greater truth that's within us. Hallelujah. Um, so last pictures here, and then I'm done with the presentation. I want to read one more scripture, then close out here. So as the earlier I was talking about scans, and here's, I'm going to show a few scans that, uh, they're called PET scans, positron emission tomography. It, they can actually, in, in j just like they would do an MRI or anything, they can uh, put chemicals into our body and monitor activity in the brain. The MRI is what this uh, would be very similar to. And so they can begin to research and look at the brain. So these two centers right here that are all big and uh, the yellow with the small amounts of red in the middle, those are your nucleus accumbens, your pleasure centers. You have one on the left hemisphere, one on the right. They intersect in the middle under the cerebral cortex. And you can see that what, what or let me explain a little bit for you, for you is the colors, is that the blue is the gray matter, that green and yellow begin to represent the density of uh, dopamine as long as the red, I mean, as long, along with the red. That red means that there's a lot of dopamine there. There's a very dense amount. Yellow not as much, and then green, not as much. So dopamine isn't only in the nucleus cummins, it's in other parts of the brain, and it's in the uh, digestive tract, and it's in a lot of the body. But what we see with somebody that's begun to abuse, and this is just a slide of somebody that's used cocaine, um, a control, which would be a neutral person, um, and then an abuser, somebody a scan they did, you begin to see that red begin to dissipate. So what that represents is that uh, it's showing the density of dopamine neurons. And the way neurons work is, to explain them easily, there are two uh, connections in the brain, which is nerve cells. And it works like a lock and a key. There's all these neurotransmitters that get relayed. And so there's a lock and key method that they have to fit in order to connect the message and to get the feelings and all that. So whenever the brain has a flood of dopamine, it gets that message if it can bind to the neuron and say, oh, that's good, I like that, remember that. Well, what begins to happen is that they become inhibited, is what it's called, to where they become plugged is the easy way to explain it. So they can't keep the density in there because nothing can bind to them. So no longer, there's not the access for me to go out and do some of these things that were enjoyable at one time and get pleasure out of them because it needs a larger flood of dopamine just to be able to bind enough to get any enjoyment from. So an addiction used to start out where at first you were getting these really good experiences, then you go back to normal, and then you come back down. Well, over time, you've used enough to where you're not really getting this up high anymore. You're just getting back to normal. Um, so let me get to this last slide. That over time, you can see, and this is meth, which is releases more dopamine than any drug, heavy drug of abuse uh, that does a lot of damage to the brain. A healthy control, because people will see this and they'll go, oh, no, my brain's gone. <laughs> it's destroyed. That whole egg in the frying pan concept, that's not the way the brain works. The brain has a remarkable ability to heal itself. Now, it gets rewired and begins to operate differently, but the body and brain are remarkable. They truly are, just in a natural sense, not even, uh, we're going to talk about spirituality with healing and addiction and all that later uh, on in another series. But the healthy control, you see somebody that's abused meth, one month abstinence, you won't be able to see it on the camera probably, but there's a tiny speck of red showing up. But then 14 months abstinence, they begin to get a lot of those dopamine neurons back. Um, or not back, but they become uninhibited to where they can access them again. So what this means, this person can enjoy life again. This person, one month sober, doesn't really even enjoy life yet. They feel like they do because I'm a month sober. I feel better than I've felt in a long time. But there's a lot of to go. So if they have a really stressful experience, that's where relapse comes from. They still can't cope with life yet. 
So not only with relapse and knowing that, but as I was saying, they that once people start having these experiences induced from drugs, whenever they don't have the drug, so their dopamine starts at a balance, it begins to be raised. Eventually, without the drug, they're under normal at that point. People start getting high just to be normal. As crazy as that sounds to people that have never been there or understood it, people begin to use heroin just so they can function that day. I've heard stories of that, of people being on job sites, uh, doing high-rise construction jobs, and saying, getting to work and be shaken, and they have to go do some heroin just to come back and finish the job when they're 20 stories up on a building. Because their body's so used to it, their brain's so used to it, it's become a part of their everyday activity now. So it, it isn't just about getting high. That's what I want you to hear, that there's, there's a spectrum. There's people that use drugs, there's people that abuse drugs, and there's people that are addicted to drugs. There's people that can abuse them that never cross that line into addiction. Um, but addicts, they use to cope with life. They use to get by, to deal with every single problem they have, they have to use. So addict, an, an addiction looks different from somebody that maybe goes out and drinks one too many times on the weekend or goes to college and uh, while they're at college seems like they could be an addict, then get graduated and then they stop drinking as often. That's not an addict. An addict is somebody that deals with everything in their life through using. So just to review, to go full circle here, that addiction has an organ that's the brain, specifically that midbrain area that has a defect that's a stress-induced stress induced hedonic dysfunction. So what that means is through stressful experiences over time, that pleasure system no longer works properly. That gives symptoms of loss of control, craving, and persistent use despite consequences. So I hope that, that it's given some vision into the disease of addiction. I hope that um, you've learned something. I, I, I always feel free to ask me any questions, whether it's during the, the broadcast feed or whether it's um, uh, through, through the week. Email me, text me, whatever you got. Um, I would love for people to become more informed. I mean, one thing, that's a passion of mine, treating people dealing with addiction. But I know people need answers for their family. Um, and so I'm not saying just having the education about it's going to fix the problems. But I know for me, understanding that it truly is a disease doesn't necessarily make it easier, but it makes it make more sense to me. It makes me understand that this is a person that's lost the ability to control their life. Now, and I want to talk more about solutions in the days to come, more about if it is a disease, where does that look like? with accountability? What does that look like with responsibility? What does that look like with all these things? Because just because I say it's a disease doesn't give people a free pass. There's been some awful things done in family systems due to it in different people's life. But last thing before the last uh, scripture I want to close with, a lot of people that, and this may be, um, I mean, I don't know if controversial is the right word, not set well with everybody. A lot of people that are spiritual people um, put the 12 steps on the back burner. They say the 12-step programs aren't as, aren't as effective. It takes God, um, all these things. That the essence of what, because the best thing about 12-step programs, a lot of people need treatment, could benefit from it, but it's a business. It costs money. 12-step programs are free of access. And the first thing that they tell you is that you're powerless and your life's become unmanageable. That's the first step. So that's what's happened in the brain. Those, those pictures I just showed illustrate it in some of the studies, and there's a lot more to all of it. That's a 45-minute summary of it. Um, but that the person's lost the ability to control their life and their life's become unmanageable. And they're in denial. They don't see it. So they lie. They rationalize. They do all the behaviors that come with it. So it's not that, um, you know, it's, it's not easy because they, they do all these behaviors. 
when you see the first step there in the brain, but then it gets to the second step and the third step, which are all about finding a higher power connection, which is most all those listening is going to be Christ, and establishing and relying on that to begin to bring the healing to our lives. So I do, I do encourage those that may be struggling that can't afford any type of treatment. Um, not every program uh, is like it. Just like every church we might go to, we might not enjoy that. But it is a resource. It's a tool. Um, I, you know, I'm, if, if you need it, do it. That's, that's my motto. How can we increase our chances? So, of course, Jesus, number one. Um, but find yourself some way to get support if it's something you struggle with. And here's the verse, because I think this is the answer in short. Verse I want to close with is Matthew 6, verse 33. And this has kind of been my motto. Uh, I used to tell Charlotte this a lot, that this was kind of the way I looked at things. Is but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what got me sober, and that's what's kept me sober. Um, and I'm not the traditional one to where I, I, I'm in recovery and I feel like I'm fighting a beast every day and I got to ward off addiction. I believe we gain power through Christ over all these things. I do believe that. But I've had to stay focused on the kingdom of God to have that accomplished. It's not that I got delivered and then I went my own way and said, well, now Jesus has delivered me. I can go do whatever I want, live how I want. I don't think it works like that. Because I believe that when we start living like that, that old nature gets back a hold of us. Now, I've not been perfect by any means. <laughs> by any means. Um, but I've tried to keep that mentality. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of God? It's within us. Jesus dwells within the hearts of all mankind. So that's another topic. want to get more in. But I do, um, I, I'm grateful to get these things going because I'm excited. I, I really do. I, I know I've already said this, but I hope it was a blessing to a lot of those watching. Um, feel free to share it with anybody. Um, I, I hope that these Wednesday night things can maybe be something that reaches people that they wouldn't listen to a church service. They won't listen to a preacher get up and preach. Um, but they'll listen to somebody share about something that they're dealing with. Um, but I pray that it leads people to those Sunday services we're doing, I believe that it begins to lead people. I mean, I pray that it begins to lead people to the Lord, not just to the education we're given, but to the Lord himself. That if I can connect people, as a priest would do, into the hand of God, that would be my biggest hope and be the biggest uh, pleasure out of all this. So I appreciate everybody's time tonight. I hope everybody's enjoyed. We will be live Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. Um, it'll be the Sunday service with worship and praise and in the Lord's direction, um, see where it goes. Um, so, so we do look forward to that. And we will continue on with those Wednesday night services next week at 7 p.m. God bless and everybody have a good week.